Jewel, thank you for that song. When we see Christ, the, the point on that is not just that he's just somebody else to see, but, uh, but the one that we're living for to see. And so Matthew chapter number 6, we're going to kind of have that thing going uh, this evening, or this morning, excuse me, I'm way off. It's Christmas lights, I don't know. I think that's what it is. So Matthew chapter number 6, teens, it's good to see you all. It's good to see teens on the front row. I think that's a good thing. Uh, the music, the singing's better up here, isn't it? Doesn't it sound better from here? Yeah, absolutely. Some of y'all in the back, you're missing out. You have no idea what we sound like. They get to, they get the whole, they get the whole effect. I'm surprised y'all aren't fighting for the front. Uh, that's the, that's what really surprises me. Uh, so I went to church one time for for a couple of years, where my buddy and I used to go. This is before I got married. Uh, my buddy and I used to go, and we'd sit in the front row, and we we got there as quickly as we could into the sanctuary after Sunday school, so we get into the front row. And uh, before you, you're impressed by my spirituality, um, the reason we would do so was because there was doors on the side. And if you were on the front row, everybody's fighting for the back doors. And I could, we could just quickly exit out the side doors to go eat. And so uh, that's where this. So anyways, there's, there's sometimes bad reasons for doing good things, I guess. And so anyways, let's go ahead and uh, Matthew chapter number six. We've been going through the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's helped me, and I'll tell you what, it's helped me in my prayer life. And, and the significance by my saying that is that, uh, that I'm still growing a bunch in my prayer life. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, when we looked at the different aspects of it, in fact, we, we read through a, a number of things um, already, uh, a couple passages of Scripture. I want to apologize, Miss Shelley. I wasn't trying to embarrass you by, by stating that. Um, in, in the five years that she's been doing this since I've been here, and I think she did it before that a little bit, um, that's the first time she's gotten one number wrong in, in, the, in the scriptures that she's written down there. And so, um, so anyways, on the other end of it, I've, I've, I've got multiples on my side of the errors that I've made. And if it was wrong, it's usually because I gave her the wrong passage. And so, anyways, that's, that's where it's been. So I appreciate that, and I do say that because I didn't want to embarrass her by, by pointing her out on that. And uh, it was, even in the, in the passage, the scripture was right, the number was right, except for the one that was a 93. Six instead of ninety-two. So, anyways, it was it was good. All right, Matthew chapter six. Uh, we'll be we'll be going through, of course, the Lord's prayer. We're going to finish off today, um, starting in verse number nine. It says, "After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors." And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the, pow the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The, the passage here, as we finish off today, is the conclusion of verse number 13. In fact, the way it, it finishes, this is one, one last petition. The, the petitions in, in verse number 13 are two, but really kind of the same. In fact, last week I spent more time on, uh, on lead us not to temptation other than to deliver us from evil. Now, the purpose on that, I, I really, I debated, and all this week I was, I was really torn on whether or not I would, I would preach, lead us not, or deliver us from evil, or thine is the kingdom of the power. Um, and so, and I, and I was looking at this, the, the way it's said is, is that God's leadership, God's direction is no question the, the, the necessity of the Christian. Uh, in, in Sunday school, we were in the book of Exodus, how the, the children of Israel had come out of Egypt and they were now released from bondage. And being released from bondage is a good thing, but sometimes we're like, now what? What, what do we do? And so when he was going in that, this is something different now. Being, being children in freedom now, freedom from the bondage there, there was an opportunity for a lot of different things to be done. And, uh, and so anyways, in that, um, we, what we're pointing out and what the children of Israel saw there in Exodus chapter 13 is that God would lead them. And we see this over and over again that God is the one that leads us. In Psalm 119, when he gives the instruction regarding to his word and, and the fact that it would keep us from sin, the point is that he would lead us. And so the, the word of God then is that light unto our feet, a lamp unto my path, a lamp to my feet, a light unto my path. He does so to give us the direction, the wisdom of which way we ought to go. So lead us not into temptation, the way you're directing us, but also deliver us from evil. And so, yes, God leads us in such a way that we would not fall to the evil temptations that we present. But as well, on the other side, he would deliver us from those times in which temptation would be us, or such that, that people would be present there that would cause us that harm or, or um, the occasion in which we would want to fall. Deliver us from that evil. And, of course, God makes the promise that he would. There's always a way of escape. Now, 
I didn't spend a lot of time on deliver us from evil, but the point is it's this kind of the, the reverse of it. We could go into a study on that, and I won't this, eve, this morning. Once I figure out what time of day it is, um, we're going to continue with this thought of for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll... Um, We'll continue with the message. Our Lord God, we thank you that we have a morning like this. Lord, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed Sunday school. I enjoyed fellowship with, with your saints. Lord, to know that this body of people here are your saints. And God, how, how the world longs to be uh, in, in such a status, to know that, that uh, before you we are accepted. Lord, but we're so grateful for the fact that it's not an acceptance based on what I've accomplished or what I could offer even, but simply by the, by the blood that was paid for my sin. I thank you, God, in heaven for the, the work that you allow us now to do. In your great power and authority and, and might, you have allowed us here to be this day in, order, uh, in this place to hear this message. And so we ask that you would give us what we need. Lord, we, we can be distracted. We, we, could, we could think wrongly. We can be overtaken by, by faults. And I'm asking that this morning during this message that you would both guide my tongue as well as the, the ears of the hearers today, that they would hear it in such a way that would be, would be beneficial to them in what we do, Lord, to have great confidence in what, who you are and what you provide for us. And so we ask this now, trusting you for what you will do, accepting what you're going to accomplish through this and desiring for you to do a whole lot more of it as you've already done in our life of, of leading us. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The, uh, the passage of Scripture that we're in is a, uh, is a portion of Scripture that's actually hotly debated. And I didn't know that, actually. Um, I used to read the Bible like, oh, that's just what God says. But, um, but now I'm learning from all sorts of people that, like, you don't really know what God's Word is. Now, I disagree with that concept entirely. All right? The, the Word of God is God's Word. And there are people that have this idea that, that you can't know what it is. Now, simply put, when it comes to the Bible, let me just explain. We are a King James Church. What we mean by that is that um, it, it, there, there's a lot of debate that you can get into, into historical arguments, the methodology of interpretation, the, the way things came about. And it's not an ignorance to that, okay? I'm very familiar with it. I've spent many, many hours of taking classes on it. I've read books. I've watched the videos on, on how the, the new Bibles were put together, okay? Um, in regards to the text of Scripture and stuff like that, the whole reason we use the King James Bible is actually incredibly simple. Very, very simple. That's this, that God's Word has never changed. That is actually the fullness of, of, our, of our position. We can complicate it with a bunch of other stuff. In fact, we have terminology about the, the infallible, preserved, perfect, uh, verbal, plenary. I mean, there's tons of words that we use to describe, but the whole position is this, that God's word has never changed. What we mean by that is that when we got scriptures, what was passed down from one church to the next church was the same Bible over and over again. And when it was different, we reject that Bible. It's pretty simple. And so when it came to that, what we have here is that we still, we have the tradition of the received text of Scripture. And so that, that's it in a, in a nutshell. Now, people talk about, well, what about differences and stuff like that? The great news about it is that we have, we, we don't have this like a Bible. We have a family of texts and Scriptures that are the same thing. We would call that the Texas Receptive, the received text. And that's something that was passed down from generation to generation, church to church, over and over again. And when it was translated into English, was with that same idea. It's the same words that God promised to preserve his word, his words, individual words, that he would preserve them. And that's why we have what we have today. And so when any scripture comes from the mindset of, well, we're not sure what is God's word and what isn't God's word. We're going to try to figure that out by taking some and adding some then we would say, well, God's word in the book of Revelation says don't do that. And you ought to be incredibly fearful before a holy and mighty God of the judgment that would be on anybody who would add or take away from the word of God. In fact, it's so important. He finishes the Bible with that, st with that statement. With the fact, well, I mean, there, there's one more statement in regards to his glory. But, but the point is don't touch it. And so we just keep and that, That's the simplicity of it. Now, the reason I say that, you might say, well, what does that have to do with the Lord's prayer? And a lot of Bibles today, they actually remove this portion. Uh, in fact, most Bibles today remove this portion when it talks about thine is like the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And there's a reason why. Because uh, Vaticanus, uh, Sinaiticus, they, they, they're two groups of, or two old copies of scriptures that are around the 4th century. So imagine 400 A.D., 400 years after the, the, the birth of Christ. 
those, those Greek manuscripts don't have it in there. Now, one of them was literally found in the trash can. Now, when the Catholics say it's not good enough for us, we should take it out, okay, in regards to that. Um, the other one, it comes, we know it comes from an area that there was a lot of corruption in regards to what was there. But they'll say, well, a lot of the, the, the manuscripts um, don't have this in there, so obviously it wasn't present in there. It wasn't until the 5th and 6th centuries we started seeing the Greek that has this. Now, the problem with that is we do have manuscripts that have this before that. In fact, um, the, the, the Dake, which is the, um, it's spelled D-I-D-A-C-H-E, it's kind of like a manual on Christian life, it was written in the 2nd century. And when they quoted this passage of Scripture, a full 200 years before Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, it quoted that part, and thine, uh, thine be the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, which means it existed. It was there. And by the way, there's other passages, and so we know it's, it's been there. Not to mention that, the scripture, the church as a whole maintained this portion as a part of Bible since, since we've had the Bible. And so based on the fact that we've received this, and by tradition we have maintained this, and not just because it's tradition, but because it's a doctrinal statement that the word of God can never change. And so for that reason, it would be helpful to remember this is God's word. And so it's incredibly important. Uh, another part of this is that in the book of Luke, when it speaks of the Lord's Prayer, we're actually going to get to that pretty soon uh, on Sunday nights and just a few weeks. It's going to go through the Lord's Prayer again. It's not the same occasion, actually. And in, in that, it's similar, but it's slightly more condensed, and it doesn't include that, which means that he's still giving instruction, but he's not saying that the Matthew passage is not Bible. So if you're like, what's the whole point of this? It's very simple. This is God's word. So when I, when I tell you this, we start off with something. God wants you to know this. Jesus is giving us instruction in the Bible. When it comes to the Bible, we should believe that the whole Bible is God's word. And I love the, the title for it, the Bible. You know what it means? It literally means the book. That's all it is. It's the book. It's not like some special like um, spiritual. It literally just means book. And so I love the fact that like there, there's not a title that you can add to it that's going to make it more the book because it is the book. It is the book. It is the word of God. And so I love the fact that when we talk about the Bible, we're talking about a book that would be above every other book. We're talking about a book that cannot be improved upon. We're talking about a book that doesn't have more or less than it should have. We're talking about the perfect word of God. And so I love the fact that we have that today. So we talk about our holy Bibles being that holy book of God. And so this is what we have. Now, it's an important introduction, I feel, because uh, there's going to be a lot of people say, don't even, don't even talk about it. Um, don't, you know, it's not even in there. A lot of messages will go without it because of the fact that this is not in passages in a lot of Bibles today. Well, it's in the Word of God, so we're going to keep with that. Now, in, in the, um, the Lord's Prayer, we've gone through a number of them, starting in verse number 8. Um, he speaks of, of um, I'm sorry. Starting verse number seven, he speaks about those people that would pray repetitiously, religiously. And so he speaks of pagan prayer. And in pagan prayer, it shouldn't be done in, in vanity. It shouldn't be empty. In other words, when you're praying, all the words matter. All the words matter. You ever hear stuff that, like, the words don't seem to matter? It's like words that are being said. Um, let me give you an example. Um, music. All right. So sometimes music will have things that are put in there, and they're a filler where it's just kind of a sound, like a lot of, like, the modern-day Praise and worship music drives me crazy when they'll throw in hallelujah as like this nice sounding thing that doesn't make any sense within the, within the song, but it, it just sounds good and sounds really Christian. And there, we're talking about praise be to God, and we're like, let's just throw it in there, just say it a bunch of times, sounds good, and it uses filler? No, your words matter. Your words matter. And when it comes to prayer, especially your words matter, and it ought to be. Now, the word hallelujah is a tremendous word. Absolutely. We should be singing it but thinking about what we're saying. And when we're talking to God, it ought to be something that matters. That's why you don't have to be impressive with the words you say. By the way, on the side of music, uh, I've been, uh, I, I don't know why it's been come. I was reading an article about, about Christian music uh, a friend of mine had shared, and, and specifically talking about the church and the worship that we have. Our music ought to be different. It, it ought to be. And uh, one of the arguments that comes up very frequently, and this is just something else for you to, to debunk, all right, because um, people will use this, that they'll say that a lot of our modern songs, a lot, as far as our hymns that we use that we don't call them modern, but like within the past couple hundred years, a lot of them were bar ballads. Now, now here's the issue. That's not true. <laughs> so the, uh, pe people will say that, oh, yeah, they were commonly sang in bars. 
enormous misconception. For one thing, bar can mean, uh, when it's talking about bar ba ballad, literally it's the way in which the music was written, was for this easy like using of it, so the bars in which it was set up. All right. Now the other part is it actually comes more from a conversation about parlor music. A lot of our hymns are written with a tune that came from parlor music. And so people say, aha, see, they came from bars. And so our music should sound like what's being played in concerts and bars nowadays. The problem is that a parlor was not a bar. A parlor was somewhere that you would have in your own home that you'd entertain your guests in. And so what this meant was when people came over, you hung out in the parlor. How many of you have a parlor at your house right now? You have a, uh, most of us don't, okay? Now, what, what this means, though, this is where you would keep, like, your piano or your guitar. And so normally when people got together, you don't go, like, hey, let's all let's play some music, and you pull out Tchaikovsky, okay? You, you, you don't, maybe Justin, but most of us don't do that kind of thing, right? Um, the point is that when it comes to composition, most spiritual music was designed around psalms during that time. And so there was compositions written around that kind of stuff. And so you had psalms. But the Bible instructs us to sing in psalms and hymns. And so the hymns were then designed around parlor music. Parlor music was something that was simple, and anybody can do it. It was the idea. There's people that can do it. So it wasn't like, oh, it sounds just like the bar. No, these were like, like when your kids make up a song, they're, they're not typically putting out complex compositions. It's simple, simple, right? They're going to sing about their cereal. My kids will talk about how much they love Cinnamon Toast Crunch. I was like, oh, wicked, how dare you sing that parlor music? No, it's just simple stuff. And the idea was hymns. Congregations can come together and they can sing these things. They were simple songs. And, and the point on that is that, that there's something that you can play easily. You, you, you can oftentimes with, with corded music play a lot of the stuff and people can sing together. And so anyways, that, that's the point. Now, um, that, that's why, by the way, when it comes to Christmas music, I'll hear it usually every year, say, oh, Christmas music is hard to play. Well, it depends on your background. If you're not used to more composition type playing, then yes, it's going to be harder for you because most Christian music isn't written that way as far as modern day. And so anyway, that's, that's why, that's where a lot of it comes from. That is a rabbit trail, by the way. That can just be its own. You can take that snippet out and put it somewhere on YouTube. So the point is that um, in this, I've, I've, just, I've read a lot this week. So any, anyways, in this, um, when we look at this passage of scripture, we're talking then, of course, the, the, the pagan prayer, they're vain, they're empty, they're repetitive. Um, then we talk about the seriousness of private prayers, which I guess is the verse before that in verse number six about entering into your closet. Uh, we talk about the piety of prayer in which we go before our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Just how important that is. We speak of the purity of uh, purity of prayer in regards to the, the way in which we are going. Um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have a purity of God's will to be done and how it should be accomplished even when we pray. So that means when you pray, you come from a biblical standpoint. And you're saying, God, I want what you say. That's what I'm going to do. And I want that. And so we have to align ourselves up with the will of God in, in a pure fashion. Um, the priority is such that his kingdom come. We didn't spend a lot of time on that because we'll talk a little bit about that today. But the point on that is that God's, God's will and what his ultimate plan, we want that will to be done. That's a priority. Ultimately, we want God's will. Uh, the petitions are talking about the needs. Give us this day our daily bread. We need forgiveness uh, from our debts uh, in light of the forgiveness we give others. And then, uh, of course, to lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. And so we have the point of God's direction, protection from sin. And then we're going to finish off with one last one, the power of prayer. The power of prayer. The, the power of prayer oftentimes is, is remarked or is noted as being the, the sheer fact of praying. That Because we are praying, then we have the power. Sometimes we'll talk about the fact uh, of the order of prayer, that that's the power. We, we set it in the right order, and so everything works. Now, that sounds really good, except for the fact what Jesus is making most reference to here is, is the enveloped, um, the, the way the, the book ends to this prayer. He starts off when he addresses the Father, our Father, heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. So this is a prayer. Thy kingdom come. And at the end, he says, he finishes off, um, for, uh, for thine is that kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So you have this reference that sandwiches this whole prayer in there because there's something in mind beyond what's here. And so if we look at this, what we're saying here, when it comes to prayer, prayer ought to be a spiritual occasion in our lives. 
And oftentimes it just becomes very, very physical, doesn't it? We focus on physical needs. Is there anything wrong with praying for your physical prayer requests? No. no. Except for when your physical prayer request is only for physical purposes. All right, look, Lord, please make me healthy so I can ride the Goliath at Six Flags Magic Mountain. All right? That's not a spiritual state. Now, if there's a reason for that, because I really want to witness to the, that person that's attending the, you know, the ride or whatever. And that, that's one of my favorite rides, by the way. That's why I mention it. And so anyways, we uh, actually, the one I really want to see is the one Cedar Point, the, the, the one that's like 400 feet up and that drop. I love those things. It's been a while since. I, I don't know that I can. I'm afraid I can't do it. Um, anyways, the point on that is that we make our spiritual, we make these requests to our God, God who is spirit. We, we pray to God and we keep it all about the flesh. Lord, I really need a million dollars. Uh, can I tell you something? I've been praying for a million, million dollars. You know that? Uh, not for, for me, but for the church. Now, there's a reason for that. I'll, I'll tell you guys more about that some other day. Um, I, there, there's, there's a lot we need to do, and, and, and it's not for, anyways, it, some of you are like, what? What's he praying for? Don't worry about it, okay? Well, just forget I mentioned it. But the point is, we can't pray for the, for the purpose of, of, of trying to consume it upon our own lusts. Right? Isn't that what James warns us about when it comes to praying and things we're praying about? You can't do it for the sake of your own self. It has to be for a spiritual purpose. Uh, not only that, it's not just a spiritual purpose, but it's an eternal purpose. When we talk about this, it's an eternal purpose in the sense that he's saying, your kingdom is what we want. Your kingdom come. We're praying for that. We also are in light of the fact that you have power because the kingdom belongs to you. And so we're talking about spiritual and eternal purposes. As believers, we look forward into the day in which Jesus Christ will come. Praise God for that. We see this over and over as a scriptural uh, understanding in the Old Testament, New Testament, that Jesus Christ is going to establish a literal kingdom. Now, we believe this literally. When you have the occasions in which the Bible prophesies about the coming of Jesus Christ, speaking of his birth uh, of a virgin in Bethlehem, we knew that that is tied into the kingdom passages to describe the fact that his kingdom has come as well. Now, that was a literal coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ literally came. That's why we celebrate Christmas. But in that, we also know that what those promises of his established kingdom that would be for a thousand years, and, and by the way, it doesn't mean after a thousand years he's done. After a thousand years, the devil who has been bound for that thousand years will also be released for a time in which he will deceive the nations. They'll come against uh, God again in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. He'll destroy them all. There'll be great judgment, great white throne judgment. A judgment um, of the nations, of the individuals, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, and then Christ is going to rule and reign, kingdom without end, amen. This is what he talks about. Now, um, that's prophecy in, in 30, 60 seconds, okay? So being that as it is, we understand when it comes to the kingdom of God and what Jesus is speaking about, we look forward to that. We want that. You know, there's some great things going on in heaven. Let me tell you about one of them. People are with Jesus, that's a great thing. Listen, I'm excited about the fact that when I die, I will be with Christ. I will forever to be with the Lord is what the Bible says. That's a good thing. Uh, my grandmother was asking me about that the other day. Is that when, when, we're, when, when people die, will we, we be able to recognize the people? I mean, think about it. You'll get a new body. And uh, some of us have a lot of things that need to be fixed in our bodies. And so if you get a new body, you're going to look different. So will people recognize you? From 1 Corinthians, we know something that you'll know them. And so we're gonna, not, we're, it's not about them. Sometimes we're like, oh, I can't wait to get to heaven because I get to see that person and do this. And I'll, I'll uh, get to, in fact, I, I said, well, no, one preacher talked about how in heaven he's going to get to work on cars. I'm like, no, they're, they're not going to break, all right, if, if we had them. And so the point is that it, it, in life, so I'm sorry, mechanics here. I don't know what you're going to do with your profession in heaven. But maybe in, in the kingdom. There's, anyways, the point is that with, with the things that, that are being done, all, all, these, all these things that people are looking forward to, the greatest thing is you'll see Christ. When we see Christ. Was not that the song that we sang? About? That's what we're looking forward to. Knowing that's what we look forward to, we keep in mind that's what it's about. It keeps in mind the fact that we are going to serve Jesus for eternity in that reign in which he possesses, in that kingdom without end that he possesses. What we think about here is the fact that we're preparing for that. Um, I, I know that oftentimes we think about the tragic loss of the end of this life, but you are entering the purpose for which you are created at the end of this life. As a Christian, you are living for seeing Jesus. That's what we live for. 
we live for. Now, understanding that, um, he, he finishes this prayer with, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Uh, doxology oftentimes is something that sounds really nice and sounds really spiritual. Uh, people will sing, and in fact, in, in college, we sang the doxology, literally, there's a song called The Doxology, and they'd sing it over and over again. In fact, it was, we were like conditioned, like hamsters, where, where the bell would ring, and we'd stand up and sing the song, which I won't sing for you, but it's praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, Father, Son. Uh, pr- praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We just sing him all the time. Sometimes the bell goes off like, oh, <clears throat> sorry. And, you know, we're so conditioned to do that because I've done it thousands of times. And uh, anyways, in singing that, sometimes it just sounds very spiritual. and It's very easy to just kind of forget it. For instance, one of the things that's easy to forget is when we pray, we'll finish off in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we just kind of attach it. We say it every single prayer, so we just attach it. And this is one more thing to say but incredibly, incredibly important. And so in this, he's wanting us to remember what this is about. In this, we know that uh, the, the public declarations of God's glory are known as praise to him. Doxologies are praise to God, a little different from worship that is usually within the scripture confined, I mean, confined to more uh, private settings. Praise then would be more public. Uh, of course, private as well, but public. Uh, doxology... Um, would be found all throughout the scripture. Psalm 105, 150, verse 6 says, Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. That is the last verse of the last, um, the, the last psalm in the Bible. Psalm 150, the last one, the last verse. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. First Chronicles 29, David says something very similar to what's being said here in verse number 10. It says, Wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is, thy, thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. And what David is saying, he spends all those words to say, you are well worth every word of praise that we can offer. And on top of that, we're not even worthy to declare it with our lips. That's why in the the book of Isaiah, the Bible described that Isaiah described himself as one of unclean lips, unwilling, uh, uh, feeling incapable and and, and unworthy of telling God about how holy and majestic he was. In Romans chapter 11, verse 36, it says, For of him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 3, verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, without end, world without end. Amen. 1 Timothy 1, 17, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 5, verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying. Who's giving praise to God? Everything. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Luke chapter 2, will be my last one in this portion here. Luke chapter 2 is known as the Christmas story. When Christ was born, it says that the, of the angels, um, I'm sorry, of the shepherds abide in the field, and suddenly there was with the angel, one angel that made this announcement, with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. Now, I say that, we go through this, and it, we go through our prayers, and we understand the word prayer literally means to ask, right? 
for me. It's the word prayer it means to ask. But when you look at scriptural prayer, when we think about asking God of the many things we ask him for, and, and, and is there anything wrong with praying for physical necessity? No. Give us this day our daily bread. He, of course, instructs the importance of praying for deliverance from temptation and, and the power in which you would have victory over sin. It's important. We're, we're God's children. But he finishes off this prayer with something that, frankly, as Christians, we really struggle with, and that's praise to God. This declaration of God's holiness and power is something you struggle with. And, 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 and you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you, when you're praying, know that this is important, but struggle with what to say? Like, okay, God, you're, you're great. You, you've, uh, you know, you've made everything. Uh, you know everything um, and other stuff. You know, you're going to do great stuff. I mean, we get, kind of get stuck there. But you'll notice the issue is not necessarily that we need to find a lot of stuff to brag on God about, but literally that we need to be captured by all those things that God is. Unfortunately, one of the things that happens is we, we are constantly seeking the newer, the nicer, the bigger, the better. We, we want something. Even in our Christian life, we are, we are just we're so surprised by all the new things we learn about Christianity. But you know what's one thing that's interesting? We do learn about God, but God and who he is, what he's revealed to us, it's wonderful and it's majestic and it's powerful. But generally, the things that we're learning about is oftentimes about us. We understand something about God. God is holy, Right? We understand God's love. We understand that God's powerful. We understand that God is gracious, that God is merciful. And we learn all these things, oftentimes by experience. But the issue is not necessarily that you need to learn a whole lot of new things about God, but you need to understand some more of the depth of who God is. Um, When when my wife and I got married, my wife and I, um, we dated kind of for, I guess, like a year, kind of, right? Was that fair? Uh, We met. We hung out a lot. I, th- we, I say that because we weren't necessarily dating. Uh, she hid my guts for a while, and then we dated after she saw the light. And, and uh, I'm kidding. But anyway, so a- after that time, um, we, we finally got engaged. And it was a long-distance relationship. She was in Tennessee. I was in Florida. And, and um, so that engagement was during my last year of college. And I, I saw her for a total of like 15, 20 days during that time period. Um, and, and so anyways, got done, with, um, got done with school and went up to Tennessee. We got married. And uh, anyways, there's a lot of stuff that I learned about her while we were dating. A lot of stuff. And, and um, we learned, we talked about everything. You remember when you dated and you just talked about anything? Like any, you can have a conversation about anything, like wallpaper. And it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I didn't even care for wallpaper. She loved wallpaper. Now I, I kind of like, like it now that I can see what she can do with it. But, but anyways, one of those things that like we just talk about it. Like that would be five hours of conversation. We just talk about that kind of glue that we're going to use for it, you know? Um, and, and in this type of conversation, you can absolutely talk about anything. And I learned a lot about her. But when we got married, it's not just that I learned new about her, but now there was the experience of these things. So yeah, can't she cook? I mean, she's made some things before we got married. And I'd made some stuff, but she didn't know what I cook like. She had no idea. Uh, we, we didn't know. Uh, we didn't know a lot of stuff. about. But in that marriage, we finally experienced all the other facets there. And the, it's not just like, oh, well, you're a completely different person. That happens in marriages, okay? I know that. But in who I knew, I understood now in a better way. And I knew more about her. Now, over that time of, of, of courtship, of dating, whatever you want to call it, neither one of those words are in the Bible, so I don't care what you want to call it. But, but in that relationship, I learned, and it wasn't that I'm learning a bunch of new things. I, I did. But the greatest, uh, the greatest aspect of our relationship is the depth in which I learned about that relationship or the individual I was in a relationship with. God is not necessarily designed for you to learn a whole bunch of new things about him. He'll teach you those things. And there is more to learn about him. But the problem is that you've only touched the surface on who he is. For instance, that is the kingdom. What, what in the world does that mean? Well, we can learn about the kingdom, and we get excited about that, right? Prophecy is an exciting thing to learn about. It really is. And there's, there's a lot of stuff in scriptures about prophecy. But we get so caught up about prophecy and what the kingdom is going to be like and what the ruling and reigning is going to mean and where this is going to be and how the nations are going to work out and why are people fighting at the end of a thousand years when Christ has had a perfect reign. I mean, how, and we miss something, God. We miss him and what he's doing and his might and power. We get excited about the times and, and you know, we have stuff going on with COVID vaccines. There's some crazy stuff going out there with COVID vaccines right now. Do you know that? Some of you didn't know that. Uh, it's true. There, there's been lockdowns uh, in multiple nations about people that, that don't want to take the vaccine. And so with that, certain countries have closed down for unvaccinated people. They're locked down. So now you have classes of people that have instantly been made. 
Uh, by the way, that's just the start of things. As Christians, we're not surprised. Right? That shouldn't be like, I can't believe that's happening. Yeah, it makes sense because we know that uh, a further amplification of that is going to come is what the Bible instructs us or tells us about. Now, in that, when all those things are, are happening, we, we get excited. Okay, well, this is put in place here. And I hear talk, people talking about, well, this is a precursor to what the Antichrist is going to do. And, and, you know, the, the chips and, and, uh, and that he's going to put in our hands, and, or not in our hands, but, but people that, that follow the Antichrist and their foreheads and all that. And, and uh, RFID chips, this is what it's going to be. And they're so excited about what it's going to be. And anyways, here's the thing. We, we miss all about God. You see, what he's explaining is that it's still about him, his kingdom, his power, his glory. When we consider what this means is that, first off, that when it comes to this, that it is exclusively God's, exclusively God's. What I mean by that is we give way too much attention to this world, give way too much attention to Satan. You know, think about Jesus, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. He went in there to be tempted of the devil. That's why he went in there. Um, now, this is preparation. This is what God is doing in the life of Christ, and it's wonderful. There was, there was, Christ didn't lose being a divine person. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't stop being God at some point. But Satan is tempting Jesus, who is the Christ. And uh, in any ways, we know from, from Isaiah that, that Satan's desire was to exalt his throne above that of God's. And uh, anyway, it's interesting that the devil offers Jesus the kingdoms of this world. This is yours, the kingdoms of this world. In that, the, Jesus rebukes him, obviously, uses scripture to do so. But we know how the story works. Satan loses. While the devil, we talk about the prince and power of the air. We talk about spiritual wickedness in high places. We understand those capacities. There's not a point in which God has lost power. God hasn't lost anything. God, God has not come to a point where he has been weakened by the advancement of Satan's agenda. Because even in the advancement of Satan's agenda, God is continuing to secure his plan and his kingdom and what he's accomplishing. In Revelation chapter 20, the Bible describes the fate of Satan, verse number 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. That is the fate of our enemy. That's what's going to happen with the devil. But in Revelation 15, while Satan offered the kingdoms of this world to Jesus, what the Bible describes, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world, you know those that the devil offered, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We're talking about Jesus. Jesus doesn't need the devil. There's not a point where like, oh, the devil needs, no, it's not possible. We give too much attention to the devil and what he can do. This is exclusively God's. This also means that it's not just the Satan's, not the world's, it's not man's. Here, here's a, a simple truth that, that oftentimes we, we trivialize because of the way it's been said, oftentimes it kind of just gets thrown. I hear the statement, let God be God. Or statements like, there's only one God and I'm not him. You know, that is something that actually is very comforting. It is very comforting. You know, my patience, I, I, um, as, as a, like a kid, I was highly patient, to be honest with you. I just didn't really care what happened, like at all. Uh, as a teenager, it decreased a little bit. I didn't care so long as a certain bubble. As a parent, my children have really worked on fine-tuning my patience uh, to, to certain things, right? Um, and anyways, with that, um, uh, none of y'all would exist if I was God. It wouldn't happen uh, because I, just, I, I would not have the patience for it. Now, ultimately, I, I wouldn't exist. <laughs> and so in these things, I'm glad I'm not God. I'm glad I'm not God. I'm glad none of you guys are God. We are not, not only that we're not God, the kingdom and what God's accomplishing is not all up to you. This is wonderful because sometimes we feel like it rests on our shoulders. We think about the things that we do. We'll stress ourselves out over things about whether or not we can take care of the provisions for a family or, or the church and what, oh, everything's going to fall apart if I don't. Well, no, listen, God, God, it's his kingdom, his glory, his power. And so it's not man's. We take ownership on anything. Isn't this something that uh, we take ownership on, on absolutely everything? As children, we do that. We'll, we'll play as a little cheese it on something. And we're like, oh, that's mine. 
because I got there first. We call our desk, we call our seat in the vehicle, we call the seat on the couch in front of the TV, that's mine, I get it. We call it all, and then as we get older, boy, we really grow up and put flags on things. Say, that's ours, right? We claim everything. We never grow up, that's what history has told us. And all of those points is that we claim everything and there's not a point in this time, or not a point in history that ever God has been removed from that authority. Think about the most powerful man uh, to have ever lived, Nebuchadnezzar, back during that time in Babylon. He was proud of what he had accomplished. Look at the kingdom that he had built, Nebuchadnezzar II. And in that, um, he is humbled for seven years as a beast, this one that needed to be humbled by God, the most powerful man in the universe at that time was humbled by the God of the universe, where he humbled him because he's just a man. There's not a corner that you own that God is not there. God takes ownership because God created it. it, it we think if we're so powerful in things we do. I remember um, as a, probably 10 years ago, there's a guy that asked me to fell a tree. So I, I fell a tree. I just like using that phrase. I cut down the tree. Um, so my job, he's going to pay me 100 bucks to cut down the tree. I'm like, sure, of course, no problem. He asked me, do you, know, do you know how to do that? I'm like, of course. I've seen Bugs Bunny do it a million times. I know how to do this. And so I went over to the house um, and I, I started chopping down this tree and he said, now you got to be careful. There's a garage right next to it. And so I'm like, so just make it fall down the other way. It's a tree. So I start chopping away and um, it starts falling the other way into the garage. Now, thankfully, it was like a 15-foot tree. And by 15, I'm like, we're talking like a scraggly type of 15-foot tree. I'm like, oh, it's like, it's only this thick. And so I'll just grab it as it's falling. I didn't realize that something that was only this thick weighed a lot. And I couldn't stop it from falling and hitting the garage. Now, it didn't, like, I mean, there's like a little green mark on the garage where some of the leaves hit it. And that was it. But in my great mind, I couldn't chop down a tree in the proper direction. I know now, I've learned, and people have come up to me and instructed me, well, this is what you should have done. Well, thank you. You should have told me that beforehand. And, and now, in my great mind, I couldn't figure out what I was so confident of. We are so confident it belongs to God. Why are we praying? Because it's about God. Why? And if you think about it, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because it is about God's kingdom. It doesn't belong to me. It's not my might. It's not my power. There's not a point where I'm endued with the privilege to get it, but simply by his grace that I'm given any of it. It's all about him. Kingdom belongs to God. No glory for me, no power for me. It's all about him. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. People are going to stop thinking that there's a bunch of different powers or gods or whatever it may be. One. And pe everybody will know it. It's eternally gods. So not it's just a matter of it being exclusively gods, but of course eternally gods. We know this kingdom being that of a thousand years and then the kingdom without end. What this means is that this should be something that we consider eternally. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. And then he's going to tell you why. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay, that's a good why. But then he's going to give you another why. For the lust of the flesh, for the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. That's a good why. There's a, there's a battle that's taking place. So that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, God has you here to do something that you're supposed to do for God. Continuing on. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings. That's a big old list. So here's how God finished that list. And such like. Anything simple. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Here's what he's saying. You're part of that kingdom. Part of that kingdom. Being a part of that kingdom means you behave differently. Don't act like the devil. We, know, we read his fate. We know where he's going. Don't act like him. Since you are saved people, if you've trusted in Christ and what Christ has accomplished, in Christ and the fact that he substitutionary, his substitutionary atonement for your sin was made on the cross, completed, that he died, was buried, rose again, you trusted in that alone for salvation, then you are part of this kingdom. 
Now, understanding that, act differently. Don't let sin be part of your life. It's an eternal kingdom. You're going to be living in this manner for eternity. I love the fact this is agreeably God's. What this means, if you look at the end of the, the verse, verse number 13, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Everybody say the next word with me. Amen. Amen. I love it. All right, now, pretty sure in this one they were Baptists because they said amen. I read it as amen. I didn't see amen in there. And so I'm pretty sure how it is. But anyways, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't mind the amen. Some people say that. I, I, every time there's an amen, like in a song, I prefer the amen. I know some of the longer choral endings are amen, stuff like that. Because some of y'all old Catholics still like those songs. And so anyways, uh, I, I like the amen. Sounds Sounds good. But the point of that is there's an agreeableness to it. Um, amen. Did you know amen is not cheering? You know that? Uh, sometimes we get behind that. Hey, there's a potluck afterwards. Amen. Fried chicken for everybody. Amen. All right. We get excited because it's just cheering. And, and we're like, oh, we're against cheering. But then we cheer with amen. All right. It doesn't make any sense. The, the point on that is that when it comes to amen, there's an agreement to it. Uh, the idea would be, if we can say it this way, let it be so. Let it be so. Like this absolutely and so when it comes to this we are agreeing with god amen is almost an expression of confession where we're taking what is being said by god and what is truth and we're saying amen and we can likewise read it within the prayer amen we are in agreement think about when you pray in jesus name amen jesus gives instructions to ask anything in his name doesn't he but did he did he give instruction to end in amen well he says amen do you ever think about why you say amen? Well, it's kind of like how you close it. Kind of like you start a letter with dear and you end it with amen. No, we don't normally. Do you, do you use amen with anything else? Oh, spiritual things. Or, you know, if my team's winning, that's why I cheer because I'm Christian. All right, that'd be something, huh? I have a bunch of Baptist cheering people. Um, I, yeah, never mind, I was, sorry. All right, I wanted to go somewhere else. Uh, but anyways, the, the point is that when it comes to that, amen has this form of agreement. So the question is, who are you agreeing, agreeing with? Let, let it be so. Let it be so. That's an authoritative statement that you don't have. You don't have that authority. You have no right to the authority except for the fact that God says you approach his throne. And when we think about the kingdom and the power and the glory of God, it says you boldly, book of Hebrews, you boldly approach before the throne of grace. You say, God, let it be so. This, according to your will, I'm praying have all these prayer requests. Amen. Likewise, when we would do this together in chorus, we would say it together. Amen. We know to say that, but Lord, let this be so. Let this be, we say this knowing that when we pray, it is in accord with God. We can agree about a lot of stuff and be completely wrong about it. You can be. Like, what is the best college football team? I guarantee you all are wrong. I can say that because I'm not, I don't have, I don't have, I'm a man without a team right now. So the, the point is that when we have these agreements, we, we, we talk about like, oh, this is, what's the best car? Is it Chevy or is it, is it Ford? Not Ford. No Dodge person, huh? All right. So it's funny. In that argument, nobody's like Dodge. All right, so get out. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. If it works, I'm, 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 work, I'm for working vehicles when I'm for usually. And so anyways, when it comes, we'll have those arguments, this disagreement, and you can find people that you can walk with. You know, how can you walk together unless you be agreed? And so, uh, so anyways, you can find those formulations of people that agree with you. But the question is, when it comes to prayer, are you in agreement with God? And boy, that word amen is powerful because you are lining up to that one whose kingdom it belongs to, who is mighty, who has that power, who, who's got the glory. All glory belongs to him. In that, you're saying, this lines up to your will. This lines up to your will. You can talk to me and convince me of stuff. I have kids ask me for stuff all the time. I don't necessarily mind. We should be careful in teaching children about not constantly asking people for stuff. That, that's, that's a good virtue. But I don't mind kids asking me th for things. If, if I have a candy, people come up and, hey, can I have candy? You know, it's funny. You pull something out, and kids can hear the wrapper like this. Uh, what is it? Mints? No, no, we don't care. Um, Caramels, no. Like, wait a second. I, I hear it. Smarties. Yes. Pfft, people just bolt to me. They just know what kind of candy. These kids are like trained for it. And so they run to it and, and, they, and they're ready and they'll ask for those things. And, um, and anyways, they, they know that asking will possibly get them that. And sometimes it's not even asking with words. It's kind of like, you know, they just know what, what they want to get. Sometimes I don't really want to give it. And that they'll, they'll try to convince me. Or they'll tell me about how good they sat in church and, and how well they're doing or how they haven't had candy 
ever. Or, believe it or not, my parents don't feed me. <laughs> so candy will fix that problem, right? Um, it is not true. I, I'll, we'll talk to kids. We'll, we'll ask kids, your parents never feed you? And they'll always say, nope, we don't eat at home. <laughs> All right? So like, I know that's not true. My kids will say the same thing. And uh, anyways, when we, we talk about these things, we can try to manipulate somebody, and you may be able to. You may be able to even manipulate your parents into these things. But when you're talking to God, you're talking to, again, to the one whose kingdom and power and glory are all his, and you're saying amen. Amen. God, in agreement with your will, amen. In agreement when we prayed with others, in agreement with each other, let it be so, because this is an authority in which we're approaching your throne permission you've given. So what does that mean? That your prayer better line up. Your prayer better line up with what God has, which means we need to be following this example. How, how's, been your, how's your prayer life been? Has your prayer life been all about, give me this day my daily bread. I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Or maybe it's just, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And where God is saying, hey, you, you need to trust me for all, all the details and what you need. You need to trust me for forgiveness with that expectation. You need to trust me to deliver me from evil. You need to trust me to, that I'll deliver you from evil and to rely on me to, to not fall into temptation. You're asking for all of those things, and you're giving glory to God. Do you agree with God? Do you agree with God? If not, line it up. Amen. See, amen, amen would be a message in and of itself, but the point on this is that we need to be praying according to his will. Let it be so. So, the, the point that I'm making to you today is allow your prayer to be so much more, so much bigger. Reflect the person of God and when you're praying. And in that, you're going to see some wonderful things take place with your prayer life. You'll be lined up. God will continue to form you into the image of his son as he's aligned you according to his will. Let's, let's bow, to he bow together in prayer. Uh, I'm going to pray for us in just a moment as your heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The, uh, the prayer today is in regards to the Lord's Prayer. How is your life in light of the Lord's Prayer? I'm not asking if you can quote it. I'm not asking how many details, how many of the seven petitions are you aware of. How much terminology, how impressive are the words? The question is really, is your prayer lined up with what God has? He says, after this manner pray ye, are you praying in the manner that he has for you? If not, confess it before God as God has taught you. Bring it to him. And then start praying. What are the things you've stopped praying for that you know are God's will? Start praying for those. So let's give it a time here, um, invitation. Before we pray, I want to ask a question. Is there anybody in this room that says, I don't know for sure I'm saved. I don't know for sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be. Is there anybody that says, that's me. I don't know for sure I'd like, I'm, I'm saved, but I'd like to be. I would like to trust Christ to save me today. Would you raise your hand saying, that's me. I'm not trusting in my religion, my background, my any. I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ alone to save me. Is there anybody with a raised hand that says, that's me? I want to give everybody that opportunity. It's an important, it's an important question. I don't want to presume everybody is saved. Understand that you are then. Would you get these things right with God in your prayer? I'm going to close in prayer, and then we'll be dismissed in just a moment. Our Lord God, I thank you for the, the morning uh, scripture. Lord, that we can understand, that we can, we can grow, we can understand in, in a greater way your purposes. Got to know that our prayer requests are not being answered for a purpose that is only going to fit a, a temporal need. But Lord, to fit in your eternal need in an eternal way and in, in what you're accomplishing or that our prayers would line up with you or i think of the prayers in which we pray to to um consume it upon our lusts pray that are for our own glory pray for our own kingdoms and and, and our attachments those things that, that we frequently don't pray in the manner that you would have us to pray for, for your benefit lord i'm asking that you would would help us as we as christians grow in our prayer life that we would be prayer warriors spending time with you the Almighty, to be understanding in a greater way what it means to pray the Lord's Prayer, that we can finish with amen, knowing that we're accomplishing your will, to not come with the stubbornness of our pride, to think that anything we want is just how it works, Lord, but truly to know, let it be done, what, what it is that you have for us, it's what we're praying. So we ask this believing that you're going to continue to work and praising you for the results of it, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you.